I spent a couple hours listening to uh, the Integra System COVID leadership team, who are amazing, Julie Watson, Carl Roskowski, Jeff Kruzan, and David Chansom, the infectious disease expert, give uh, all Integra's physician review of all things COVID and Delta variant, which I'll relay to you all tonight. Um, but I have a big shout out to all of them. Lots of really good data, a lot of preparation, research, checking on everything. And so I can't say enough about those four, David Chansom and Julie, Jeff, Carl, all did fabulous and really helped educate the medical community. But um, now I wanna relay some of that information. Now, one thing people ask, well, show me the data, show me the data. Go, I'm, I'm doing videos, okay, go to the Oklahoma Health Department. Everything I've said about the rates of infection with Delta, it's at the Oklahoma Health Department site. Look at it. The things I'm gonna tell you tonight, I'll try to post some of the slides because they sent me a few and I copied a couple, but this is the data, okay? If you wanna read the journal article on science, which I'm going to refer to you, I'll post that too, but it's a big shout out to Annie Welker who sent it to me originally and now I've sent it to a ton of people and I think it's a very germane article which we'll go over. So one of the first things we want to talk about is, I've had a lot of people go, hey, can you say you were wrong or incorrect about the COVID and the um, herd immunity? And I was, and I'm gonna explain why I was, because we use something called r not, or the number of infections an average person is going to give someone to determine herd immunity. So the prior number for r not, or the number of people who'd be infected was roughly 2.5 to 3 per person who gets infected. So to figure out what the herd immunity is, you take one and you minus one over r not. So if the r not's three, it's one minus a third that gives you 0.66 or 66%. So that was the basis of herd immunity. And it had been very stable. We had not had any variants ever that went above that. And for the most part, we thought it was two to 2.5. So that was great. Well, we have the R-naught data now on Delta. So we're gonna be spending a lot of time on Delta because we're going to do some shifting on recommendations tonight, unfortunately, which is horrible, but it's what it is because of the science. So unfortunately, Delta is much more infectious than all the other, the original COVID and all the variants. It's R not is six. The average person will infect six other people, not two or 2.5 or three, six. That is a huge change. So that means one minus one over six, which is about 16 to 18% <laughs> equals about an 83% level of immunization or infection for herd immunity. Now here's the second part, and this is really what is unfortunate. If you've been vaccinated, this part's good, you have the current data is you have a 0.7% chance of getting a mild symptomatic infection with Delta, okay? That's the current data, roughly. And it may change to a couple percent, but it's, you're gonna be fine 99.9% .9 of the time plus, okay, if you've been vaccinated. It is looking like it will be minimally the same, 0.7%, but maybe much higher with prior infection as your source of immunity because the mutational change at the tip of the spike protein is a, is a true gain of function. So if we think about SARS-1, it, it had a gain of function versus the corona cold viruses. SARS-2 had a thousand percent increase in infectivity compared to SARS-1. Well, now we have Delta that, because this is all the data that has come out that I've been reading today, and there's been a ton of things out in the last 48 to 72 hours because there's finally accumulating data. 
it's minimally 25% more infectious in terms of viral particles, but then the clinical thing is it essentially doubles the infectivity rate. So that's why we had herd immunity about against everything, but we have a totally new nasty version of COVID now. And so that's the problem. It's the problem. And so predicting things is based on current data. I, like I think most of the rest of the world, was not anticipating a gain of function that was going to double the infectivity rate. <laughs> because that hadn't happened in 18 months. Well, now that Delta's out and been around for a while, we're actually seeing the manifestations. And the thing to keep in mind, that's its gain of function in the hot weather with the sun out, which kills it in seven minutes. So at least we can be happy it's not the winter because it would probably be much, much worse. So that's the problem. That's what we have to think about. And so thinking about that, the other data from now, the data from the Integra system is that they're seeing younger patients in their 20s get it. About 25% of the people, and I'll put the slide up, in, who are hospitalized are younger in their 20s. Number two, just globally, 99% of the people hospitalized are unvaccinated. 100% of the people in the ICU are unvaccinated, 100% of the people who have died are unvaccinated. So that's the reality, okay? We do not know or previous infected data definitively yet, but the trend is that they are going to be more susceptible to Delta, and it's the initial trend, and we're waiting for better data. But at this point, it is a strong consideration to get one vaccine to augment your immunity. The paper I referenced from the journal Science from about a month ago clearly showed that the immune system in someone who's been infected revs up with one vaccine. And in that paper, it was Pfizer. So that's what I would encourage. Now there's some caveats to that. I would only encourage people to consider this who have had mild or minimal or asymptomatic infections. If you got pretty sick, moderately sick to ill or severe, severely ill, I would not encourage you to do it because you could reinstitute similar symptoms. But if you were mildly infected or minimally infected or asymptomatically infected, the Delta is a true change and we have to understand that. I don't like it either. I don't like having to deal with scientific change when it goes against everything we've been taught and learned over the last 18 months about COVID, but that's the problem with COVID. It is a unique and nasty virus. I, the explanation for that may be it's mother nature. It may be this virus is just so incredibly unique. It's different, which makes me always think it was man-made. And again, we'll leave that alone for now. Additionally, there's symptomatic changes. The, the alteration in terms of how sick you get is much more rapid. So with COVID, we see people get sick and then they deteriorate somewhere between day seven and 14, usually towards the latter part. What we're seeing with Delta right now in the community in Northeast Oklahoma is about day five to six, people suddenly go down the drain, often having minimal symptoms. So again, uh, minimal symptoms, get yourself tested right away. The good news is the Integra system is, is very readily able to give the monoclonal antibody. It looks like it's a 68, 60 to 80 percent reduction in um, hospitalization with the monoclonal antibody. As an aside, we encourage everyone besides putting them on ivermectin and doxycycline uh, to get the monoclonal antibody. We just had a, someone who we treated uh, a few days ago, and we don't know if it was the Delta, but it probably was because the vast majority of the state now are. She got quite sick for one day, called. She did ivermectin and doxycycline. She was fine by the next day after being very sick the day she started it. So again, that's our data on ivermectin. It's 
again, these are, we use it because of the prior studies, the double-blinded trials are in process. So that's where we are on the Delta variant. I also get asked a lot about kids um, and pediatrics. So with the Delta variant, I still think I would be very, very hesitant to give a vaccine to people much under 21. Um, it's just, again, really rare for any of these people to get sick. I have to see what the data evolves to with the Delta with peds. Um, we had a long conversation among it, among ourselves about that. There's definitely a split in our opinions uh, with some very intelligent people. So some people in our group think they should go ahead and vaccinate all kids. I still do not think the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, and there's a couple people who feel like that with me, like I do. But so that's a conundrum. Uh, it's a conundrum to do a vaccine in children that, you know, the rarity of, of catastrophic events is so low that is the vaccine worthwhile? And my gestalt is still no, that differs from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but I have some comments about them <laughs> that I'll actually write later because yeah, they're, they're not a reasonable resource. They're uh, not, well, you'll see when I get my written post done, which I started on today. So I think it's up in the air on them. I'll try to provide better data on kids stuff, but so far I'm just not seeing that the risks are worth the benefits. So that's where I am. That's I'm, the summary. I have one question based on what you just said um, about if you were positive in the past, if you tested positive, maybe go ahead and get one. Would I, you... I would encourage everyone to strongly consider getting at least one Pfizer vaccine if you were infected in the past. Would you still wait six months? I would still wait at least three months for that. I would not have people who had moderate or severe infections get the vaccine. One, they had a stronger antibody response. And two, I'm concerned that the, I'm sorry about that. I'm concerned, oh, your phone showed it was running out of power or something. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I, I would still be very concerned they'll be get sick. The two, we had one severely ill patient and one moderate, or, nearly severe but really not very moderately ill patient get the vaccine against my advice within three or right around three months or four months of their um infection the severe patient ended up in the intensive care unit once again on a ventilator for five days and almost died she's still recovering and it's three months later the other person um got quite ill from her vaccine. Um, she had to get massive amounts of steroids at the hospital. She recovered but felt horrible. And we finally had to do a bunch of different interventions, which actually worked and we got her over her long haul syndrome and got her recovered. So, and so we do have avenues for that, but it's, it's a lot easier if you just don't get super sick from the vaccine because you already got super sick from COVID. So that's where I am on that. And I'm sorry that we're having to change, but one of the things is Science requires us to evolve, and that's the difference between someone like me, who can evolve what they're saying, and perhaps other people in the public sphere, sphere who are gonna go down with their ship of their recommendations. At some point, I'm gonna talk about masks with kids, which I think is ungodly stupid, and, um, but, you know, I'll be an outlier on that too, I guess. So that's it. Good night. Sorry I don't have more positive news, but Delta is a problem.